Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zolman. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It is truly an honor, and there's my lecture. <laughs> oh, there it is. All right. to have the opportunity to stand here before you today. And I really appreciate the... Um, all right. Um, it, the title of my lecture, The Odyssey of Cancer, Pain, and Woman, um, I initially had it labeled as um, uh, shame of pain versus pain of shame. <laughs> and, and, and I think Dr. Rosenstein gave me a, um, a starting point to actually frame what I mean by shame of pain versus pain of shame. My patients are ashamed of their pain, and their shame pains me. Why does it pain you? Because I just get as, just as marginalized, and nobody wants to talk about it. And the classic example is my son, when they ask them, what does your mom do? He's like, that's just private stuff, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he was six years old, this is when he was 12, and, and, and when he was six years old, when they asked him, what does your mom do? He said, coochie doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time he's 12, that simple coochie became this, let's not talk about it, doctor. <laughs> So unlike, so that's what the shame is all about. So to really frame what I mean, I'm going to start with the story of the woman I sh have the privilege of sh um, serving. OK? Uh, endometrial cancer. And eventually, I kept on going to the doctor and doing this. And eventually, she said, Lena, you know, eventually your hole going to close. And we don't have no specials around here for that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are, are you really, really kidding me? I've struggled for about four years with uh, urinary burning, the urinary tract burning so badly. And I've been on. So four or five different antibiotics. I've had uh, different diagnoses. Uh, I, atropic vaginitis. Uh, another one was urethrotrigonitis. Another one was uh, I know I had a I had a transvaginal ultrasound done, and I've had vagifem and, uh, to insert because that they thought that might help. It did not. Um, pelvic floor syndrome, that was another diagnosis. Like I said, ain't nobody really never ever, like, tell me nothing. I wish they could have said, well, you know what, you need to do this, or we can't do it, we're going to send you here. I have been struggling for so long with this problem and so many antibiotics. What I want to know is how come none of the urologists that I went to, four or five of them, thought of this or had heard of this had, had they never been. didn't nobody never tell me I had to do this and that I thought I was doing everything I supposed to do is hard it's more hard than me just being a woman and me being me you know being whole you know I had cancer what um 2001 with this introduction um I think when it comes to cancer, there are multiple facets that everyone struggles with. And, and I think there's a so-called biological and psychological. Um, but I think sometimes when we marginalize a field categorically as bad or good, the difference between psychology and biology cannot be separated. And I'm going to take you very rapidly through my journey as a clinician as I moved in parallel with my patient that is started about 10 years ago and switch. So do I have any disclosure? I've been, my research has been supported by NIH. I am fortunately, I don't have any disclosure. I love to have disclosure. <laughs> so what is quote unquote sexual pain, pain with intercourse? What is the prevalence? Um, how many women suffer? What is the context? 
if you look at the literature, um, they, there is a very high prevalence of pain with intercourse. But then if you look at pain in general, regardless of cancer, it's a very high number. We just, for the most part, don't talk about it. So about 10 years ago, um, as um, I was going through my master's in public health, I, I started looking and I saying, OK, let's just start from basics. Let me do a systematic review and read they, because pain and intercourse is considered female sexual dysfunction. So when you label something sexual dysfunction, by definition, it means psychological. So sometimes we are faced with a reality that we've inherited from our past. And that assumptions are the ones that cripple our back. So I kept then looking. And you know, this one actually, when we did this, we actually narrowed this down to um, only hysterectomy, because the data on cancer patient was so sparse, and the numbers were so high that we just excluded cancer patients altogether, because it was, this was already bad enough. And <laughs> <laughs> so you added cancer, it became even yeah. So, um, but the key thing is that when we say sexual dysfunction, you're talking about, and if I see, there's a arousal difficulty, orgasm difficulty, non-orgasm, and dyspronia, means pain. Um, it's almost like analogy I'd like to say, if somebody has a jaw pain, would we call them they have eating disorder? Mm -hmm. So somehow, somewhere along the line, we just decided that pain is a sexual dysfunction. And that decision led to absolute stop and halting of any further research and understanding of biology left it to the domain of psychology. And there are many psychologists, in deference to my colleagues, who have been fighting this battle as to this is a pain condition, but there's no conceptual framework. What do I mean by that? When we examine a patient, we got to know, is it muscle? Is it nerve? Is it skin? What am I looking for? When we stopped, the, when we started saying this is a sexual dysfunction, no sensory neurophysiologist ever was born. This just stopped. We just stopped thinking about it in terms of nerves, muscles, and skin. And this is just going, um, um, they're just trying to highlight that if you look at this, these are like, this number hasn't changed. It's the, uh, Anxiety, they say, is most common, um, and 33% is, is uh, in the patients who have quote-unquote sexual dysfunction, they have anxiety. But I want to, I'm, I'm going to be very provocative here. What is the percentage of men who have sexual dysfunction, even let's eliminate pain, who have, have it because of the anxiety? What is the percentage of men who have sexual dysfunction and they happen to have anxiety? About 40, 50 percent. But when you think a woman, what comes to your mind? Be honest with yourself. Psychological. But when you listen to the Viagra commercial, you never imagine that one of the most common comorbidity in male sexual dysfunction is actually psychological. How is that that continues on making research and development, and my constituents are have a glass of wine. <laughs> and not to mention that, and by the way, she's hurting if it weren't bad enough. So 20 or 30 percent. Now, this, and I, and I don't know how familiar you are with up to date, but up to date is one of the medical, um, uh, it's, it's an online resource that all of us look for to really get immediate information. And I just took these screenshots to sort of show things from doctor's perspective. So if you look at a um, it, then this is saying male dyspnea, and it says it's a rare thing, but oftentimes if men happen to have dyspnea, it goes along with this disease and this other disease. And this is woman and woman symptom. And aside from the fact most of these conditions are also not well described, and I just sort of say you take my word for it. But look at this person who has like condition radiation history of GYN or urinary cancer. And this is what we see, caveat, nothing. <laughs> nothing. So 
10 years ago, and this is where my journey began, 10 years ago, I was, okay, we established we don't know anything, so I'm going to reverse engineer as much as I can from orofacial region, and I hope that my pictures at least will bring some laughter to you, mm -hmm. um, hopefully, uh, <laughs> into simplicity. So uh, desperate time calls for desperate measures, mm -hmm. so I got to close this gap. I'm like, well, mucocutaneous junction, orofacial, let's just start reverse engineering. So. And this is, in, scientifically speaking, every time we go after something, we have to start with a conceptual model and then iterate and iterate and iterate. And that iteration is very time consuming. And I'm standing here after 10 years of iteration, still iterating, but got 80% of it covered. Um, so if somebody has urogenital pain and we start with provoked, I sort of said, okay, they could have muscle pain, they could have skin pain, they could have function, less defined function. Um, they could have these things can feed into one another and like a spinal cord reflex, make somebody contract without them knowing, sort of like you put your foot on a nail and what does your other leg do? Okay, that could happen, that's what that means. And they could have all these psychological stuff and environmental stuff and they could have these biological things. But these are not, com brain works in electrical current. It doesn't, emotions, it leads to biochemical chain reactions. So, and I one by one started parsing things out and then came to a point where I broke down the exams to five dimension and came up with an ability to tell whose the story is it. Is it nerve, muscle, skin? So, Starting with skin, when patients have radiation, whether it's orofacial radiation or chemotherapy, how many people will have, may have diarrhea? So when you have diarrhea, what happens to the diarrhea if you're having diarrhea 10 times? What if you have a sensitive skin? Mm -hmm. And does anyone know what that, how, how different people's bottom look like? with respect to the diarrhea, how you wipe all the time, what happens to the ulcer. In fact, most women keep on washing it and they use more soap and it hurts more and it scrapes. And if you're lucky, some patients, if you're lucky, you don't develop persistent pain and your body heals. But what else happens in that process? I don't know. I'm just reverse engineering from patients because I always see the end result. So if you say have oral mucositis and you go to PDQ statistic in NIH and you say, show me what are the things I need to do, you get all these things. Does biology discriminate about mucosal surface area? Biology does not. Mankind does. Mankind decide what area is reputable and what area is not. Biology recapitulates itself, does not discriminate. If you try to look for mucositis for women or genital area, you see nothing. So I put the picture of lip and this is labia because I want everyone to see the biology for its truest essence. You have hairy skin, you have non-hairy skin, and this is wet. You have hairy skin, you have non-hairy skin, and this is wet. You just flip mouth 90 degrees and you get the same biological correlation that you will get in the orofacial area. Now, as I was preparing this, I had to, I always try to make something that patients can get, do something since we don't have science. Well, we do, we're trying to create the science, but unlike most other things, this is preventable. We could do something about it. It has to just start when somebody starts having diarrhea and then education, and many of these things could be preventable. So I just wanted to put and communicate to the community simple tools that if somebody's having diarrhea or they have any problem, no asterisk cream or anything like that, water and oil. And the best oil is my secret oil, and I'm just gonna make a fun, I'm gonna just, because when I say this, it's, it's a very secret oil, and then I know I said that I don't have any um, disclosure. It's actually Crisco shortening. <laughs> I did try to use my scientific acumen 
to talk with colleagues in industry to implore them that, can you guys please market this for patients? Market size wasn't sizable enough. So, but any mom, any woman can say, you put Crisco, you better wash that hand 100 times. Olive oil, coconut oil, that thing is coming, come off. So what we need is that, imagine you have a third degree burn and the area is raw and you're walking. You don't want things rubbing on it. There is no product out there that will protect the skin. The lip itself will rub against one another. The only thing that will make a barrier is something as nasty as Crisco. <laughs> yes? Is that something you could put in every night just to keep yourself in a, in a ready way? Yes. <laughs> just because. Yes. I, I know. Oh, but, um, oh, it's been a huge thing. I mean, my husband cheated on me and was having a relationship with someone else because I could, because um, I lost my breast and my uterus and I was completely dry and I had no get up and go or anything. And then my OBGYN ordered um, uh, the Sylphendale cream and then has ordered me, I'm seeing her, I think next week sometime. And I guess there's these suppositories, D-M-A-E, that are made in a um, private pharmaceutical company. H have you heard of them? Yes, I mean, we use all kind of product, but the question is, again, is it nerve, is it muscle, is it the skin? Patients spend so much money and I do use compounding pharmacies as well because there is no product. But when I do it, I do it in a very strategic manner. It is because, again, I want to emphasize this knowledge base was developed over the past 10 years. And unfortunately, you're looking at the first one. So it will take time. And, and, and the, the other issue is that at what point patient will say this is important to us um, and that is going to be the other limiting factor because it, what happens is patients don't talk about it and then doctors are rushing and you get the sense that you don't want to talk about it because, you know, why are you being disgraceful about being alive? This is this really messed up psychology that they have and that's how we get you by subconsciously getting you not to complain about things that are the quality <laughs> of your life. <laughs> Oh, I'm being taped, I'm dead. So, um, so, but the water, this handheld shower is the best thing you could ever get. Um, so these two are, are any patient, when you have diarrhea, just rinse it. The skin gets irritated and, and I have no idea what person of the patient, what is the prevalence of this. I, all I see is the end results and I'm getting reverse engineering on those who have developed a chronic condition. Um, the other thing that happens, you know, when men, you mentioned is that um, when you have, and this is a nerve thing, uh, when you have nerve irritation, just like you throw your back, you could throw your pelvic muscle. So patients develop this contracted pelvic muscles and they're not able to be intimate. And then on top of that, you have this irritated skin. And so there's new methodologies, tools have to be developed that I'm like developed very slowly with biomedical engineering that is designed to allow this to um, occur. But to make the long story short, when the skin is irritated, if you're getting chemo and you're having diarrhea, oil and water will save the day. Mm -hmm. So that was my one message. Um, using any of our compound other than the ones that are designed for burn, for example, like estrogen cream, they have antifreeze in them. They will burn a raw skin. Steroids have preservative in them and they will irritate the skin. And, and this is my magic. Um, Crisco, honestly, I'm gonna start bottling it, and this coming in here and saying that sometimes the hardest thing, the most simplest things are the ones. You spend 10 years 
doing all these neurophysiologic to arrive at Crisco. <laughs> but it doesn't make it any less, but it makes, doesn't make it as uh, appealing as far as the fanciness of the science. Yes? And what about coconut oil? It's more of a natural. Yeah. So the coconut oil, I, you know, I, have, I give the options for coconut oil. Crisco is like the worst skin that are completely sloughing off. That's the only thing that works. So it's like the big gun. But coconut oil, and, I, and, and that works well too. The only thing with coconut oil is that it has a nice smell, um, but it melts. It's a white, and it's very watery. So it depends on the skin, depends on the condition. If you have, your skin is mucositis and is sloughing off, um, it needs the Lord. So now we're going to start from the person perspective. And this is, I think, what is important. And, and, and interestingly, my colleague from um, psychiatry will exactly making the same point is that when patient is having a, um, has cancer, you have acute care, nursing, and the doctors. And it's sort of like survival. But then we think about rehab. But the irony is that we need to start here. When somebody's introitus is completely radiated and is a year and a half out or the skin is completely, um, they have developed neuropathy, it's too late for me to reverse the path. I got to start here. Um, and, and this is a challenge, so I'm just going to frame it. So the, the conventionality of mind-body is something that is completely artificial because as a sensory neurophysiologist, I mean, I will put it in a very simple term. When you get embarrassed, your face turns red. That's epinephrine, norepinephrine. That's an autonomic response. Clearly, your emotions are having an impact on your vascular supply. With what they do and how they do is the area that my work lies. But the fact is that it happens is irrefutable. And to Get and comment about stress-mediated exacerbation of a, and I'm going to use the fancy word, autonomical, you know, uh, peripheral nerve, is, has to be psychological. That's insane. I could use medicine to sort of decouple what you feel from the heart rate increase, but that separation is just, it's just not making any sense. So what do my poor patients go through? <laughs> so money, family, and family with no money. Then... This is another stress. It stress your surgery. Nothing compares to the stress you're going to feel to get you know, these prescriptions. Now you're going to manage this prescription. And good luck trying to get the pharmacist to cipher. Getting into the, um, into the um, health care system and fighting. And, and if they have any time, again, this is coming from my perspective of my end. There is this image issue, but by the time patients get to me, they pass the image. They're just trying to make sure the bills are there. And, and then there's the end of life issue. And then there's all this stress about what I'm going to do with my kids. But what these patients don't have is the one thing that they want to have, the not being able to be intimate with the spouse, a feeling that my husband will leave me, or should they leave me? Is it my fault? It's very convoluted. It's very sinister. It's a mess, the kind of which I don't even know how to decipher. All I know, what happens in my patient's head, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. And all I know is heck of a lot more than when they have pain, it's magnitudes worse than fatigue and trying to be intimate. It's that pain being, med pain being said it's in your head. Um, and, and there are patients who want to have the ability to be intimate with their spouse, but they can't. So is it possible, is it possible that when we give chemotherapeutic agents to patients, they could develop neuropathic pain in the peripheral nerve? Is it possible? So does body discriminate between peripheral nerve that is here versus your finger, and I don't have the pain? It's the same caliber nerve. Why would it not happen in genital area? Can it happen? 
probability-wise, it is likely to happen, but why don't we know about it? It goes back to that decision to call the genital area as irrefutable. I mean, it's, it's something that is not clean. We don't want to talk about it. And it's, it's tattoo. Tattoo, look at me, taboo. Mm -hmm. Well, tattooed it with being a taboo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but half the time what I do is go into the orofacial pain, see what the drug does to the mouth, and try to reverse engineer to the other end. Um, and again, this is showing that you have the nerves here, you have the muscles. Can you have a nerve irritation that leads to the bladder problem? So now patients, and now I'm going to take you guys back through what my poor patients go through. And this, I hope, will either make you angry or make you laugh, or both. So now patients have survived their cancer, now they're going into survivalship. Hallelujah. So you go to the websites, and you're trying to do all the right things. And then, and there's all these... And, Please correct me, but I was told that this is a very commonly sought after cancer support group. Am I correct? Yeah. All right. So I, I went to their website. And then it talks about the intimacy and sexuality and all this stuff. And, and this is what they say, loss of uh, desire in man and woman, trouble getting or keeping an erection for a man, having pain with um, gentle caressing or vaginal penetration for a woman. Having pain with gentle crescent. So if you have, rub your hand for a woman. Um, if you scrape your arm or if you fall off the bike, if somebody rubs their hand over your arm, it <gasps> raw. Those are some of the sentinel points of neuropathy. Or it could be a very dry skin. Or it could be a dermatitis. Women well, don't know. We don't have pictures telling women what a normal looks like. We do have pictures saying women what they should look like, even though nobody knows the spectrum. And half the time, many of the patients that I see, when I have mirror and I ask them, what does it look like? They're like, oh my god, do I have to look at it? Um, I assure you, that does not happen with men who have urogenital pain. When I go and take care of male with urogenital pain, they help me move the goodies and say, it's right in here, right in there. But woman, the very first thing they do, I clean my toes. Oh, do I have to look at it? So these are some of the cultural things that I think entire system has to take ownership. And so here's what happens to women. They're going through this. If you're a woman who is having pain during sexual touching or intercourse, it is crucial to get some help. A first step is usually to use a vaginal moisturizer regularly and put lots of thin water or silicone-based vaginal lubricant when, you're, when you have sex. This thin water-based silicone is completely useless, but let me as it may. If your pain persists, see your gynecologist for help. So what is a gynecologist going to do if your pain persists? Yes, ma'am. When I went to my gynecologist, he told me to go see a psychiatrist. And I'm like, no, why don't you go to a psychiatrist and figure out an, a solution for me? I said, you know, this is ridiculous. You're young enough to be my kid. And I said, um, I said, and I'm a metastatic patient, and you're going to see a lot more of us. We're growing in population every single day. We're living with cancer. I and mean, I think, yeah, I, I think what is important is that when you frame the problem, maybe you're coming full circle, when the problem is framed as one thing, it's a belief system. When you believe to understand versus understand to believe, when you believe something to be, you no longer start looking at the pieces to understand. And, 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 that's, and then there's no framework for gynecologist. Um, just because gynecologist is willing to look at the bottom, doesn't mean they know what to look for. I yeah. It burns. Yeah. <laughs> it burns like mad. Well, not having sensation isn't necessarily what you're looking for when you want to have sex. <laughs> At least you weren't told to have a glass of wine. <laughs> so, and this is for men. Please look at the difference, okay? For men. So woman is passive, 
receptacle. Mind you, just, just take this to the basic. As a receptacle, if you're having pain, it's up to you to understand. And that's where we stop. What is happening to you, what could be happening to you, it stops as dryness. You know, just, or you have some sort of emotional thingamajig. But look at men. If you are a man with an erection problem, see a urologist to explore medical treatments, medication, penile injection, even surgery to have a penile prosthesis. For men, being able to have a firm erection can be the biggest boost to interest in sex. I rest my case. <laughs> Do you see the difference? Thank you. So, yes, ma'am. And for men, there's an assumption that the medical is stopping the interest in sex, not the other way around. Bingo. That's another thing. You're not lubrication. It's because it, we stopped. We, we stopped science in women by saying it's in their head. So coming back full circle, and this is just, I'm just going to go over very fast. Um, these are like just to give you an example of what this knowledge does to patients. Um, and I use this as a, as a young woman. Um, she had um, cancer of rectum and vagina that was treated with radiation and chemo. Um, it, they couldn't. It was something they couldn't quite figure out, was it histologically vaginal or rectal? But regardless, the key thing is that she got radiation and chemo. She came in, and, and she noticed that, hold on, is this one right? So when she first came in, she, she, and she was getting married. And she's like, you know, five months into it, she's like, oh, I think I'm getting pain. And they're telling me to use lubrication, but something isn't right. So the vaginal, when you start putting radiation, tissues start collapsing. But if you brace just like a broken leg, if you develop technology to stent, if you will, which is quite possible, um, because once you know exactly where to go, then it won't. It will just, if you will, evolve and it will scar in the pattern that you guide it. So I MacGyvered uh, with what we had. And I have like little plier, and I use the available tools that is from everywhere to actually make a fashionable thing for individual patients. So the MacGyver worked, and she was doing great. Then, oops, then she came back, and this is a, um, um, let's see. Then she came back, and it was a year later, and she said she's having a lot of burning, and that she starts having pain. This was a year out. Um, of urination, intense burning with urination. And they've looked at her, and they have said that, you know, they even did a biopsy, which hurt quite a bit. Um, but they said, you just have radiation changes. And then I sort of did my thing, which is, say, is it nerve? And I said, do you have any problem with diarrhea, bloody diarrhea? So make the long story short, she had proctitis, radiation-induced proctitis. But in order for me to get her, to actually get the care she needs. I sort of had to have her go to the oncologist, give the diagnosis that your rectum is causing problem, and then they said there's a vaginal ulcer for her to get hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I mean, I had to literally educate her what she should say in order for her to get the treatment. And and, and even though there was no vaginal ulcers, I said, well, we got that. It's, it's your rectum referring back. And guess what happened? It worked. Wow. Now, what would have happened to her if I were not to be able to separate her nerve referring to the vagina and her muscles? What would have happened? Why? What? What? Not talking about these things have huge implication because what in fact was happening is that she was getting severe proctitis, and the manifestation of the proctitis was a referral to the vagina, and that was being missed because we have never developed algorithmic thought process as to is it a nerve problem, muscle problem, skin problem. So, where am I today? And this is the lecture I say, you know, having, you know, having developed about 10 years of doing this foundation work, 
um, for it to become clinically something that people will take on as a matter of programmatic relevance. Our industry, healthcare industry for the most part is driven by patient needs and to some extent um, what are the R&Ds, what are the uh, medications, what are the biomedical innovation and sometimes doing, using the basic things, using the tools you have to create and address patient needs is not necessarily as marketable. And that's why when patients complain about it, then it becomes an issue and people are more aware about it. Um, these are my advices to patients that um, diarrhea, if you have burning with irritation and urination, water and oil, cold application. Uh, I get a candlestick and would put it in the freezer. If it could stop the inflammatory process, oftentimes it becomes self-limiting. Um, and this is my things with the doctors, is like sometimes acceptance, sometimes our best isn't enough. And by saying that, that makes a world of difference. And this is what I practice day in and day out. Um, and, and I think on a personal humbling experience, that tension between seeing what patients need and lack of ability to deliver has been a creative fuel in going to other parts of the body and trying to reverse engineer. But it started from saying, I don't know. I don't have the knowledge. And this cannot be. If it happened in the face, it's likely to happen everywhere else. And in 1933, Ellis said, in every department of medicine, and not at least in the most intimate of all, it is our business so to adjust the condition of life that, if possible, evil may not arise. There is no field in which it is more necessary than in, uh, than in that now before us for the physician to acquire a wider knowledge and exercise and finer intelligence. With that, I really appreciate your attention. I think I made it on time. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you very much for your time. So what is my recommendation to combat pain um, uh, and sex resulting from vaginal atrophy caused by chemo and targeted therapy? And what, is, what does neuropathy in the vaginal area feel like? So starting with um, what do I recommend in, uh, for patients who got irritation at the opening of the, in, with secondary to chemo and radiation? This one is a tough one. Um, because when the vaginal tissue, when the vaginal and vulvar tissue, and oftentimes it's a surface area, are so trophic, the only way I am able to reverse the severity of inflammation and bring the tissue back to what it used to be is topical, high dose estrogen. It's 0.05%. It is not market available on market. There is no other way. I use it and I do blood levels on patients just to make sure that there is no systemic absorption. It's about one cc. But because it is not something that people know about, um, like the oncologist, my colleague at UNC, they, you know, because patients who are oncologists, you always go to oncologists, they're comfortable. Um, but a lot of times, other oncologists, as soon as you say the word estrogen, um, they back off. And, and, and I think it's often as important to say the more we're scared about something, the more, I mean, there are a lot of things we don't know. We're making headways and advances, but there are a lot of inconsistencies in the science with regards to estrogen. Last year, I um, yeah. was a speaker who did a similar kind of thing at Anderson, and this, this exact topic came up. And he also was a proponent of gastrodiology. 
Um, and he said that if you're on an estrogen blocker, tamoxifen or anastaz or some pain mm -hmm. one, the chances of that estrogen global, global topical being anywhere else outside that area is almost zero. Not, you can see zero, but it was so small. It was right. Not worth it, not too I'm glad you brought that up because there were there are some instances. Um, thank you for bringing it, but that I needed to use the estrogen for a, if you will, longer period of time, or I had a patient, if you will, a patient who was who wanted he she didn't want to use the high dose estrogen because high dose estrogen just completely reverses the process in six months. I mean six months, six weeks, six to five weeks. Oh, this is a compound in pharmacy. Yeah. Can you tell us again? About that, so it's a high dose estrogen. It's not commercially available. That? It's estradiol. Oh, that's, that's yeah, zero point oh five percent. That standard estradiol is zero oh one percent. So you can reverse symptoms in women who I'll give myself as an example. Um, dries the Sahara Desert and who had a total hysterectomy 15 years ago, tamoxifen for many years, uh, chemo, blah, 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 haven't been able to have intercourse for 10. You can reverse in six weeks with that? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that, remember what I mentioned, skin, nerve, muscle. So long as skin is the problem, but when somebody hasn't been intimate, you end up with muscle contracture. So I have to bypass the skin and then I see what's left with the muscle. But as a rule, and, and when you brought it up, the high dose estrogen that is administered topically is the only way I could make this move fast. And I measure, but, it's, and, but if I have to use, and I had one patient who wanted the standard conventional estradiol, that needs to be on there for three months, four months. In that specific patient, we use tamoxifen or estrogen blocking or from some, anything that the oncologist wanted it to make sure. But at the end, it was like a three or four months of having that. Um, whereas the higher dose estrogen, which is not FDA approved, it is not even commercially available. It was something that, to be honest with you, I just sort of pulled it out of my head and that came from being an obstetrician and seeing how extraordinary fast postpartum patients heal. And they heal so much faster. So, and physiologically, you could use steroids, uh, estrogen as a steroid. And conventionally, when you think about biology of how steroids work, it's usually like when you have uh, steroid, they pulse the steroid because most of the benefit of steroid happens when we give high dose, short duration, and a lot of time bad things happen when we have prolonged exposure. So being able to pulse uh, the estrogen for six weeks and, and then stop. So what is, it, what is uh, every day? At nighttime, just one cc. But I sort of show where to place it. Pardon? Point, uh, 0.05 percent. And it's, it needs to be, but, but I have a mirror and I exactly put it where it needs to go. And I show patients because everyone needs it in a different area. Um, so it's about a CC, so it's not one of those things that, and that's I think one of the issues is that when people have pain, you don't know what, and doctors are, nobody's correlating the perception with what's going on. But to answer the question, some of the sometimes, and the story that the patients were referring to was that sometimes it's just um, pelvic contracture, thrown pelvis. And all I need to do, just like we do in orofacial area, to you know, block the nerves where the patient doesn't have any pain and just sort of stretch the muscle. And it just becomes normal, just like a locked jaw. So. What is that treatment that you're talking about? Oh, like sometimes pelvic contracture. Like if you, sometimes people literally have equivalent of thrown pelvis um, that gives them the uh, symptoms where they're having all these urinary symptoms and one of the cancer survival la lady who had met breast cancer and um, endometrial cancer, you heard her account saying, I had all these urinary symptoms, I had pain with intercourse. And how is it that nobody, but it was a muscle um, making the referral. 
so the, the issue is that one has, has to develop tools to sort of say, this person says, I have pain with intercourse. Is it nerve? Is it muscle? Is it skin? And after 10 years, you usually have definitely some muscle. Um, you definitely get some muscle. It's a given. Um, and, and so you have to, but once you understand which one, whose story is it, you target the primary, and then you go after the secondary. Are you but, saying that physicians are not going to prescribe that to easily? No. <laughs> Is there a way to, to stretch yourself in there? Pardon? Is there a way to stretch? Yes, there are ways to do that. And, then, and I think this is time for patient advocacy because patients can, again, this is the fallacy of the situation. You know, if you have, a, if you have videos of how to do these surgeries, it is okay to be in the YouTube. But if you have videos of how to help someone, it, it will become, it becomes a bit unconventional. But this is where the patient education and patient advocacy, um, and there are these um, websites that women are empowering for education, but yes. But to do it, one needs to know how to do it, um, and needs to know about the anatomy. So when I see a patient, each person is different, because I break it down, is it a nerve, is it a muscle, is it a skin? Not every person who have like the colorectal cancer patient, she needed to go immediately to um, um, two years out. She had proctitis that was referring her dyspronia had nothing to do with the quote unquote vaginal dryness. Um, and I got her better by having her to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But it was that knowledge of whose the story is it and the tools that had to be developed over 10 years to separate them out. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know there is actually some physical therapy in, in women or people that are specialized in um, like pelvic floor therapy and things like that, and using things like the bone wall balls, or they even have like weighted ones that you can use to help strengthen the muscles in there and get those back to functioning. Um, so I don't know if maybe through an oncologist or, or anybody, but you can try to find someone specialized in that to help and give instruction. I'm, just glad, I'm glad you brought this up because, again, the issue is that when you have dyspronia, a um, lot of times it could be muscle because a lot of women have background myofascial pain. But if you also happen to have a skin problem, skin hurts so bad that the physical therapy cannot do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a feed-forward mechanism. Um, but because you cannot fix the muscle, even if the muscle is the main thing, without addressing the skin, when the skin has, skin has gone so bad. Um, and with respect to physical therapy, the, the challenge is that a lot of women may, in fact, respond to um, physical therapy, depending on what the primary ideology is. But if somebody happened to have neuropathy that they don't know, when you stretch the muscle without medication, it actually makes their pain 10 times worse. So these are some of the challenges. Yes, ma'am. If you already have a great deal of dryness, what do you think about products like Replens or Astroglide? Like, do they make it worse? Do they help? Crisco. <laughs> Say that again. Crisco. I'm being very serious. Just keep it away from your dogs. <laughs> I got into my thing and ate a whole thing of Crisco. Oh, threw it up on the so one of my one of my because all of my patients say one of, one of my patients and and this is um she um actually she's the same lady who was talking about she's a breast cancer and uterine cancer survivor and she's so when I you know very sophisticated woman and and she comes in I'm like I think you got a muscle problem we could fix the muscle with a little stent that I was put out my plier to make it for her. And I said, but your skin is a problem, so we need to use some Crisco. And she just looked at me from her eyes. And she's like, are you kidding me? I waited three and a half months to see the expert at UNC, and you're pulling a plier, and you're telling me to use Crisco? And then um, one visit later, she came back. And you see how she was saying, she's like, Actually, I thought I was pissed when you came in with Crisco and the plier. 
I now need to see a shrink. <laughs> I have been dealing with this for four and a half years. And all I, need, all I needed was a Crisco and that, that ridiculous little thing that you fit. I mean, she, she was like, nah, I need psychotherapy. And she was just going on and on and on. I was like, nah, I need to go and see all those doctors who told me that. I need psychotherapy now because I've lost four years of my life. Do you have an opinion about the estrogen ring? Do I have an opinion about the estrogen ring? I think, I think with the, with the, going with the palliative process, if I were to say what is the best thing I will do is that I will create, I would say woman to use, if they're having diarrhea, just rinse with water and put plenty of oil. I don't think you need Crisco as you're going through it. It's when you start irritating yourself and, and that we get into the trouble. But just using water, rinsing, oil. And then when, the, when they're going through this breast cancer and they're hypoestrogenic, that's the problem in that we're, we don't know what the right thing is. Meaning we don't know, we, we know we can't give quote unquote estrogen. But there are ways that one can actually maintain vaginal canal from shrinking, and that is using uh, like a pessary, hodge pessary, uh, where your woman, you have it wear at nighttime, because every time you stretch the vaginal canal, you're essentially promoting blood flow. I mean, and this is a lesson we learned, it's an empirical means that we just see it. Menopausal women who are sexually active, their vaginal tissue looks fine. So. Inaction is what becomes the issue. So if I had my way, I will make women their personalized pessary because the Hodge pessary, I have to bend it and, and use my plier to make it work for them. And then have them just wear it at night time. And just wearing that night time, not having them contract, uh, I think, and I'm putting the word on I think, will be sufficient to minimize many of the problems that women face later. This, this yeah, but all of us already have it, so Pardon? <laughs> all of us have problems already. So, what percentage of problems do you think could be prevented with appropriate intervention at the start of, of cancer treatment? Scientifically, I don't know. What would you guess? Intuitively, many of them, if not all. If not all. So, but how complicated is it because we are on continuous chemotherapy? It's not like it stops. We're always on treatment. That's why the palliation works, because if, I, if, we have, if we talk about oil, and you just go over the basic stuff, and then you sort of stent the vaginal canal, like the same way you wear night guard, and that's just part of your routine, then you just don't develop the problem. Because vaginal canal is, for the most part, a cylinder, if you will. And, and um, I have my pictures. But I just imagine opening of the vagina where the urethra is, is the muscle area that you could contract. Upper part essentially follows in caliber, at least side to side, what the aperture does. So if you maintain the muscle open, which many women actually don't have the perception of when the pessaries are placed properly, then the rest of the canal will follow. So you essentially eliminate and in a way create, if you will, equivalent of intimacy, scientifically is this gonna work, is to be determined. But my intuitive feeling, giving my success of reverse engineering and fixing many of the patients, I think it should work, if I could reverse it. And what's it made out of? Is it like for something you would buy it online? Or? Working on it. <laughs> until Rubber, yes, I, until then I just have to use my plier to make it for you. Pardon? It's plastic silicone that they use for urinary incontinence, oh. and I just MacGyver it to make it work for my purposes. But I'm working with biomedical engineers to make it better. But see, nothing moves fast because this is not considered programmatically relevant. So I gotta go at eight o'clock at night time and talk with this person. We do the drawing, we need you know. To demand. Pardon? We need to demand. Yeah. Are you taking new patients? <laughs> I, I take any and all patients. We're in the 
And, and then in fact, I, I will really encourage patients to start self-advocacy and, and, and put out the information how to care. Because of all the silos and because of all the shame in this area, I am not necessarily able to sort of say, here's a video of how you do the most of the basics. I mean, if you go out there and you see labioplasty, which I'm sure you've heard of, there's no problem with the labioplasty because it's driven by the market. But if I start talking about the pain, you may get some eyebrow raised, and I, and I will just leave it at that. But if women themselves take charge, if they women say, you know what, this works, and they tell one another, I think we could use some simple tools to increase awareness and create better option. I mean, these are all prototype that one is using in order to make ends meet. Could I have my doctor contact you? Yes, anytime. Great. Yes. Well, you know how Dawn dishwashing liquid was just for dishes, and now they use it for oil spills, they use it for highways? Mm -hmm. You are going to be the new face of Crisco. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you get a piece of the revenues. You want trials and sample sizes for all your patients. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the thing is that a lot of times doing the right thing is actually extremely difficult. It's really difficult. And, and I did, and I have colleagues in Procter & Gamble that I went and said, you know, we really can use this. But it's all about the programmatic relevance and the market share. So if you have all these products, that look, smell good and funny, and, and they invest on it. All of a sudden, investing on a Crisco in a bottle, if you will, um, may not be as appealing. And in fact, I hope there are entrepreneurs here who, once they see the success, you know, if you could raise awareness, bottle them. Entrepreneur, we, we need innovation. And, and it works. Quadrupling my cost. How about a fundraiser for MC? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you. for your talk.